are familiar with us, the network is an emerging community of people who are exploring the integration of what we call sacred inclusion. We all have different opinions as to what that looks like. But for me personally, I see sacred inclusion as nothing else, nothing less than a sacred path in and of itself. If you'd like to learn more about us, please visit our website at diversityandspirituality.com. Today, it's my privilege to interview the fabulous Laura Tucker, who's a leadership coach and transformational speaker, and she's the host of the Free Your Inner Guru podcast. You can, if you're working on, looking on the screen, you can see the, the, the sort of like the emblem on, uh, to her left. Um, Laura's mission is to guide conscious leaders and to navigate the continuum between ego and authenticity and to ensure that self-help is conducted in a truly safe and empowering way. Laura's helped hundreds of entrepreneurs and business leaders navigate the challenges of, of leadership while remaining true to their, her, their authentic values. She's featured in Enlightened Us, which is on Netflix now, uh, produced by CNS, CNN, and she's appeared in numerous uh, television shows, including the C CNN News Newsroom with Brooke Baldwin. And Laura, if you don't mind, I'm going to start this all over again because I stumbled so much on this word. Yeah, that's fine. That's I don't fine. want to have to do it all over again. So yeah, yeah, I totally feel it. <laughs> <laughs> Call it practice. I'll slow it down. Okay, and then you know what? That's great because I took my glasses off oh. after we started. So <laughs> I have trouble maintaining eye contact when I have them on. They're prisms, and it's weird. So oh god, we don't want you to start hallucinating right in the middle. No, of the no, it's all good. <laughs> so yeah, we're good. <laughs> Go for it. I'm listening to that going, it's sad. That's a mouthful. I need to slim that down. <laughs> yeah, I'll probably cut it down so I don't mess up. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, this is Angelo John Lewis for the Diversity and Spirituality Network podcast. In case you're not familiar with us, the Diversity and Spirituality Network, which we're now calling the Sacred Inclusion Network, is an emerging community of people who are exploring the integration of diversity and spirituality. We have a lot of opinions as to what that looks like. But for me personally, I see sacred inclusion as nothing else, nothing less than a sacred path in and of itself. If you want to know more about us, please visit our website, which is diversityandspirituality.com. Today, it's my privilege to interview the fabulous Laura Tucker, who's a leadership coach, transformational speaker, and the host of the Free Your Inner Guru podcast. Laura guides conscious leaders to navigate the continuum between ego and authenticity and to ensure that self-help is conducted in a truly safe and empowering way. Laura has helped hundreds of entrepreneurs and business leaders navigate these challenges. She's been featured on a number of national networks, including CNN, uh, including the podcast Enlighten Us, which you can find on Netflix. Laura, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Angelo. It's a pleasure to be here. Laura, I always ask people, I'm going to ask you, you won't be immune. Give me some sort of sense as your own kind of religious or spiritual background. Well, I was, uh, I guess, born, baptized, and raised Roman Catholic. Um, I come from a family of teachers who all worked in the Catholic school system where I lived when I was a child and live again now in Toronto. And, uh, you know, we were church going, sort of traditional Catholic family. Kids went to Catholic school. The family went to church on Sundays. And, uh, and so, you know, a lot of my experience of religion, I just had the context of education. Right associated with it because of the you know the catholic school system and um and so then you know as i got older i had questions and uh, and some challenges that you know brought faith and and religion or traditional religion into question um but that's that's sort of where i where i came from yeah i mean you and i are, are a little, I'm probably a little bit older than you, but um, I also went to Catholic school. And, um, you know, I had a big rebellion kind of thing in high school. I'm, l I'm lucky I didn't get kicked out of school, um, but the priests liked me, so I was good. But people were kicked out of school for not believing the orthodoxy back in those days. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I, I too was rebellious as a as a teenager. I liked I liked to have a lot of fun. <laughs> Draw whatever conclusions you want out of that. 
and uh, and it, you know, irony of all ironies, my first career was as a school teacher. And so I also went into the Catholic school system and, and spent about seven years all told in the education system. And, you know, and it wasn't at that time for me about organized religion. It was more about familiarity, um, you know, where the jobs were. Right. Um, but also part of my challenge began during the process of having to go and, you know, interview with the priests prior to being okay and signed off as, you know, good enough to teach in, in the system. And, it, and some difficult conversations ensued. And, and so in a way, even though I was on, on that path for a time, um, just very much being on it and being a young adult in the late 80s, early 90s with lots of questions, lifestyles were changing, living arrangements were changing, my parents had uh, separated. And mm -hmm. you know, I found myself at an interview about me um, being put on the defensive about what was up with my parents. Wow. And I, and I do think, you know, looking back at that now, I haven't thought about that in a very long time, but I do think that that was, that was kind of where the, the two paths started to, um, to diverge. Right. You know, Laura, a lot of what we're going to talk about is, uh, you know, you were in this documentary, Enlighten Us, and, um, you know, the thing that sort of prompted it, which is this... Uh, a thing that happened, which we're going to talk about in 2008. Um, I wonder if you could paint the picture of what was going on in the culture. What was going on with you at that time, um, 2008? What's going on? Um, what's going on in the culture? Sure. So um, as far as me, since I've already referenced my, my first <laughs> career, um, by 2008, I had left um, the school system. And I had gone into corporate life um, as a first as a trainer, then into sales, and I had started my own consulting company. So I was consulting to um, the automotive industry, and there's a whole long, I think, boring story about that. But if it's a business podcast, maybe it's more interesting. But it's on your uh, website also, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. And uh, and so um, at that time I was living in Western Canada in a beautiful place in British Columbia called Kelowna. And, um, I had moved my consulting business out there and, um, this was in the days. So in 2008, the, uh, the recession had started in the United States. I was living in Canada. The, the effects were more muted in Canada at that time, um, than the United States. But um, being in the automotive industry, I was in a highly affected sector. Mm -hmm. So my business life had become more challenging um, through the eyes and experience of my clients who went from relative ease in terms of operations and, and their environment shifted so much almost overnight. And at the same time, I was, I was, um, business was um, an area of strength for me. But on the personal front, I was making what I now look back on somewhat fondly as um, I was choosing increasingly unsuitable partners to, <laughs> <laughs> to date. Right. And, uh, and there were areas of my life that just weren't reflective of, of, of um, I wasn't experiencing joy, I was not experiencing ease, um, and I was having a lot of frustration. And in that time, you know, self-help, I had always been a reader and, and, and had read a number of sort of the traditional Tony Robbins books and Stephen right. Covey books and, and more with a view to business because that was my thing. And around that time, um, a friend of mine who worked at one of the, the car dealerships that I consulted to handed me a DVD and said, hey, you want, might want to check this out, Laura. I think it's something you would be interested in. And that DVD was The Secret. Mm. Now, The Secret is known now in 2019 as some people say, oh, I, the, I, I read the book. But it started out as a, a DVD that sold broadly across and became a huge, um, a huge inflection point for what we now consider the self-help or personal development industry in that it made a lot of people aware of um, 
certain, you know, teachers, um, speakers, workshops, and that's what happened to me. So that was a catalyst for me to start exploring, you know, maybe there's something that I need to, to develop here. Mm. Yeah. And there's a confluence with, with the new age movement was, was big at that time. Um, Self-help, um, trying to find myself, the traditional way is not working. Um, what can I do? And there are different places to go. There are workshops and there were sweat lodges. <laughs> well, there were, there were all, and you know, there were, I don't want to treat the sweat lodge in strictly in isolation, but there were, it was a breakthrough culture. Yes. And yeah, so, you know, so it's one thing to, to look at the secret and, and see these, um, you know, coaches and, and authors and, and speakers talking about the law of attraction and, you know, with a fundamentally empowering message. Um, but it was quite another thing to, you know, in my case, I, I went down to um, San Francisco to Oakland for my first um, weekend experience. And, uh, and so this was, this was one of James Arthur Ray's uh, workshop. He's featured in this, in the secret alongside the likes of Jack Canfield and Bob Proctor and John Asaraf, like all, a lot of these, the big names, the, the, that are big names now um, were, were in the secret. And that started an 18 month journey that culminated in the infamous um, sweat lodge experience that, that went tragically wrong. Yeah. Tell us about it. Well, I'll put it in, I need to put it into context. So going back to that breakthrough culture, a lot, every workshop, every experience had some kind of metaphorical breakthrough, whether it was, or physical breakthrough um, that was designed to teach participants that they were capable of more than they thought. Hmm. Whether that was breaking a board or walking on fire Right. You know, common um, activities in self-help circles. Not common to the general public, certainly not common 10, 11 years ago, um, you know, some more common now. So um, the retreat that, um, you know, in question was what would be considered an advanced workshop. It was five days in um, the Sedona area, not in Sedona proper, but at a retreat space in the hills outside of Sedona. And it was, it was five days of a lot of really intense um, personal reflection. Very different from the other events, which were, you know, attended by hundreds of people. Right. It was a group of relatively small, um, I, I forget the precise number, but let's just say 50 might've been 48, might've been 52 participants. And, um, and the, I'm using air quotes for people on audio only, the breakthrough experience of that retreat was a sweat lodge on the last day as the last thing that we did together. Now a sweat lodge um, is a traditionally native um, activity which brings up, there's a whole conversation to be had around cultural appro um, appropriation, right, appropriation right. which is probably not my conversation to have, but, yeah. um, but it comes from native tradition. It is an enclosed um, structure, typically with, you know, covered in, I believe, you know, hides and, and, uh, and fabric. And the participants go into the sweat lodge. I, you know, liken it to an intense sauna experience and uh and the idea was that you know they, they bring in um rocks that have been heated on, on a fire put them into a pit in the middle of the lodge and there are there are several rounds of of activity um not activity but intention and uh so it it gets you know quite hot and it was positioned and intended as a, as a breakthrough experience. And the metaphor of it was rebirth, right? Like going into the sweat lodge and coming out, you know, so this is done intentionally. And the intent was to, you know, let go of the old and then 
post sweat lodge, celebrate and go out into the world and create what we had intended to create in the world. Which, Especially a purification ceremony. Um, yeah, yeah. And I don't know that your audience needs that, um, you know, that breakdown. But I find a lot of times there's a lot oh, of... Oh, it's useful. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I've done sweat lodges, so, but everybody hasn't. So it's nice to, nice to explain. Mm. So you're going through this, this big transformational experience. This is sort of the last day and you've gone through that, you know, they, they poured the hot water on the rocks. It's hot. And um, I imagine, you know, you're getting something out of it and then something goes wrong. Yeah, the by degrees, um, you know, in hindsight is, well, it's tough to say anything is 2020 on this because, you know, there's a lot of people and a lot of different experiences, even within the same relatively yeah. small space and time. Um, but, you know, the, the bottom of it or the end result was that three people lost their lives. Mm. And so when you look at, um, the, you know, the cause and the effect of that, even the difference from, you know, the, the peak of expectations in terms of what the intention was and then the outcome, um, you know, at no point in time, and I can only speak for myself here, but um, at no point in time did, did I believe going into the lodge um, that there would be any serious you didn't think You didn't think you were in danger at all? No. No, despite there was a lot of build up, there was a lot of um, there's recordings and people who watch the documentary on Netflix can can hear a lot of what was said to set it up. Um, and, you know, my expectations was that not the word hype is coming up, but, you know, getting people into that peak state. Right. So they'll have the peak experience. But one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. Mm. And um the difficulty uh, that was starting to be experienced within the lodge um, was, you know, it was confusing. I remember it as confusing. And, um, and then my own personal experience um, was exasperated mm -hmm. by um, the, the person who was beside me in the sweat lodge. Her name was Liz Newman. Um, during that time, I had enough wherewithal to become concerned um, about her well-being and and spoke up but things unfolded as they unfolded and you know and Liz ended up um, dying not mm. on the scene but in the hospital a number of days later wow so it was just heartbreaking I mean I've never been involved in anything like that but I can imagine it had to be devastating for you and in order to be able to be talking with me now um, in a nice affect and there must have been some healing to take place you know, I'm just wondering I mean we could talk forever about the who was wrong we're not going to get into that exactly but we are going to talk about leadership and what's appropriate but I'm, I'm curious as to how you went about healing yourself um, you know through that I'm sure well, that you didn't get up the next day and say okay well this happened you know well I will say you know it's been almost 10 years 10 years is coming up mm. so a large degree of that is time and, you know, 10 years is causing, um, you know, a lot of reflection um, and a lot of memory and some reoccurrence of what can only be described as trauma. But, you know, for the longest time, understandably, all of the focus was on the, the three people who passed away and their families. And... James Arthur Ray, who was held, you know, criminally accountable for the result as the leader in that situation. And very little, um, you know, attention or opportunity to, you know, speak publicly beyond the initial, um, it's a cult on CNN type coverage right. that, that this event received. Um, you know, a lot of it was done in private and um, I was very fortunate in that I had a strong support system where I was living in Kelowna, practitioners who I had been seeing prior to. So they knew me. 
Right. You know, like it's almost like they had the baseline, <laughs> you know, whether that was, you know, the, an, an acupuncturist, a massage therapist, you know, a um, couple of energy workers. I was already, let's just say I adapted very quickly to the new age life right. back right. in 2008. So by end of 2009, I had all kinds of wonderful people in my life who were there and ready to facilitate the initial stages of healing. But it went on for quite some time and to be honest is still you know is still ongoing now this this type of event doesn't just no. go away yeah you know what strikes me laura um i don't want to get into a big uh, conversation about the the principle um involved in that but i do want to spotlight there a number of things like this have happened they keep happening there are these charismatic leaders um, many of them have something to do with like yoga or, or I'll call it new age or, and not, not just alternative stuff, but even in the mainstream stuff, you know, Catholic priests and things like that. Um, there's something that happens with, with, with people, especially men when they get in a position of leadership. And um, I know it's a lot to ask you, but what is your sense as to what, what, what happens where there's kind of this disconnect between what should be going on and what, what is actually going on? Well, you know, Angelo, it's in many ways, it's the perfect thing to ask me because I've spent 10 years thinking about it. <laughs> and that's a part, you know, really a part of my healing journey has been to come to some kind of understanding on a number of levels of the dynamic of, of leadership. And I think that it's not just topical within the spiritual circles, um, but it's also topical within political circles and yeah, the true. leadership realm as well. And so the way that I've come to see it, and there's so many, there's a lot of different dimensions here, but it's so easy to rule people out as our situations and people out as outliers and say, that is something that's on the fringe. You know, it's not normal and it's easier to understand very black and white. And what I've learned, you know, and I'll just backtrack for a second. And a way to do that is to say, oh, that's culty. Right. And leave it out there in that, in that category. Like it's not happening among Catholics and politicians and all these other people. Yeah. Or, or, you know, at the meeting you just had in your corporation. Thank you. Right. Right. So it's happening all the time. And so I find it much more useful. And quite frankly, it's the only reason why I speak of it publicly because you know, the sensational piece is done and, and is harmful. But I think there's a number of lessons when you start looking at, you know, here you have um, a leader, any leader, any human. And just like it's easy to rule things out to the margins, it's also very easy to label people as, oh, he's a narcissist, she's mm -hmm. a narcissist. And, and just, you know, put the label on it and maybe avoid it that could be very healthy, but not to really delve into some of the root cause, which is that we all have the capacity to slide down the continuum. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens is a lot of times these human beings who start off with very, very good intentions, and this is where one of the big lessons for me is intentionality had nothing to do with the outcome, mm -hmm. right? In, in terms of the specifics literally what happened um and that as certain elements like um potentially wealth certainly mm. fame um very lofty prestige um what can happen is we slide down to that if we're going to say uh, there's a spectrum and at one end is is you know let's call it authentic leadership um and and at the other end, a more sort of egoic, hubristic, narcissistic leadership, we all have that capacity within us. And, uh, and so it's, it's incumbent on ourselves, and this is one of the reasons why I believe in the, the self-awareness journey, is it's incumbent upon us, especially as people who lead, and we'll get into following after, I hope, but to, to have a temperature mm -hmm. on, like, you know, really, how connected to reality am I right now? Am I, am I you know, by, am I reading my own press? Am I believing my own press? Mm -hmm. Am I 
you know, starting to lose my compassion? Am I starting to lose touch with that person? Um, and, and starting to think that maybe I know better. I do want to I remember about the following thing. So if I don't get to it, please remind me, but I did want to ask you this one thing. Um, uh, and you were very democratic about it. You said men and women. Um, when I look around, I see mostly men that are, um, quote, um, doing these kind of things. Now I'm sure women do, um, but it seems to be like, when I look, it seems like a mostly a male phenomenon. What is your sense? I, I think it would be a mistake to rule out, rule women out from having the capacity. Mm. It, it, it may be because first of all, you know, it's not just about gender in terms of chromosomes and organs. It's, it's, um, you know, uh, there's masculine energy, feminine energy, right. we express in different ways. Like I'm a woman who happens to have a lot of masculine energy. That was a part of what I was learning on that very path was how to not, you know, there, there's a, there's a traditional um, model for success and it's very masculine. Yes. And so, and this was part of what I was learning how to um, unwind in my own life because that was part of a part of what was present, preventing me from having um, good um, loving relationships with men because I was, I, and my husband would laugh and hear me see that, but I was boss <laughs> and <laughs> He'd say that I still am, <laughs> but um, but I I lost a lot of my softness and because of what it takes to be successful in the corporate structure, yeah. which where I spent a good amount of time there after leaving teaching. But also remember where I was consulting. Right. I was consulting the automotive industry, which goes without saying is very male, and you know generally speaking, what I saw in those times looking back is that women in those environments, right. will, one of two things, they'll either, you know, become overtly um, sexual and, and maybe one of three things, one is neutral, but, you know, and use their femininity. And, and I used to think that was horrible. And now I see it's actually sometimes healthier. Um, but also the, the way that I responded within that environment was to armor up, mm -hmm. right? Just shut it down. Very straight, very, very, you know, hardcore. And so operating uh, like a man in, in, mm. so I don't think that we can excuse women, especially since really how many women have had the leadership position in the opportunity to prove to. the hypothesis. Right. That's very well said. And uh, I particularly like the fact that you, you say, well, you didn't say, I guess I'm saying that it's like these, I'll call them negative leadership capacities are in all of us, you know, and various circumstances can bring them out. Um, they don't necessarily have to, it could be wealth, it could be fame, it's the adulation of others, all these kind of things can sort of trigger these kind of, um, I'll call them negative characteristics of leadership or broken, broken aspects of leadership. Um, now you, you did talk about, now obviously there's opportunities where we, we get, get an opportunity to be around charismatic leaders. We also have a responsibility to sort of check ourselves in that kind of um, situation. Can you, can you talk a little bit about good followership in that case? Sure. Sure. And this is a relatively new area for me to talk to in a, in a public forum, like podcast. Um, so eventually um, after a long time, I had to start looking at not just, you know, you look at varying levels of responsibility for it all. That's, that's a part of, of the journey, um, but to really look at how we show up as followers. Mm -hmm. And so many people, and to, to even start with self-help events, you know, one of the things that was a revelation to me about going to these workshops was the amazing, open-hearted, um, inspiring people, genuine, sincere, and you know receptive receptive to growth receptive to each other receptive to looking at values and and wanting to you know embrace um what at the time was new for me was to think about being you know a, a spiritual person because mm. i'd associated that with being religious so there's something very beautiful that happens there but there's also then you know and then there's this wisdom these lessons these breakthroughs 
And the, the benefits of that, it feels good and it can be easy to just, you know, abandon yourself to that. It feels safe. It feels like what could go wrong, really. Right. You're in a vulnerable position. You're learning something and you're drinking this sort of in. And at the same time, there's some sort of boundaries that you have to draw some kind of way to protect yourself in a certain sense. It's, it's not just that, though. It's more than that. It, it is because, you know, it's, I, I was thinking just as you were speaking, it's not all that much different than say being a school teacher and you've got a room full of, you know, young minds and I will I'll stick say at the high school level, you got teenagers there and they want to question they want, but they want leadership. They, they want you to provide you with, you know, the, the basics of an education, some respect and create a safe environment for them to show up. Now they would never tell you that, but that's what they, right. <laughs> that's what I found they wanted. <laughs> and, um, you know, this was like going back to school in many senses of the the word, the world for me, because, you know, I was doing a ton of reading, I was doing a ton of learning, a ton of experimenting, and, you know, really caught up in my own self. And that is a space where you think you have permission to do that and not worry about what the others are doing or what the leader is doing but it can set up a dynamic that is potentially um difficult and that and that's one of the things that you know if if i'm keeping a list i'm doing some writing these days and you know looking at what did i wish that i had known i don't know that it, it would have changed a thing but it seems to me to have an experience like that and the con you know, subsequent decade, it, it's like I'm writing a love letter to myself mm. a dozen years ago to say, you know, these are the things to be cognizant of while you're on this journey. Mm. Go on the journey, but also realize that at some level, yes, you are responsible for your outcomes. Um, but then that responsibility, when things go really wrong as they did, responsibility is a really sticky mm. area as well. Mm. Now we could talk about, uh, and we started to talk about sort of inappropriate leadership styles. And I'm sure, Laura, that you have um, examples in your life of people who have exhibited positive leadership qualities. Maybe you could talk about them and maybe contrast them to some maybe negative styles. Mm. Well, it don't have to be anybody. Yeah. I think yeah, no, that I wasn't expecting what you that. admire. Earthball. Yeah, no. So, um, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about a teacher that I had, um, Mr. Palini. So Mr. Palini, and I'm also going to talk about a mentor that I had, Freeman Pat Patterson, both men. Um, but, uh, Mr. Palini was a high school teacher and, when he came into the classroom, he came in with his lessons, history teacher, with the storytelling, with, with the personality and the ability to, to move students through story, which is perfect for a history teacher. But he also brought his humanity into the classroom with him. He brought in stories of his, you know, of his daughters, of his wife, of family of he would at times share challenges um and not inappropriate sharing but you know just really pragmatic examples of you know this is the conversation we're going to have today and always find a way to relate mm -hmm. story you know and probably a lot of my ideas early ideas on leadership were you know came out of that sort of history political science mix that that he positioned and, and then the other uh, person who I, I want to share is a photographer, a Canadian photographer named Freeman Patterson. And uh, Freeman is, he's in his 80s. And he is somebody who, when I was realizing my creative passion was photography, I, you know, this is long before the whole self-help journey, but I would invest and go on workshops 
to go and learn more of the craft of photography. And little did I know, and I understand well now, that creativity is such a, um, a way into a person's spirit, really, because of the self-expression. But, you know, there again, I found, um, you know, a mentor who is very concerned about the well-being of his um, students, about the understanding, and, um, and who always, you know, I, I grew to learn in later years, I went to one of two of his workshops since the uh, Sweat Lodge, um, and two before. And that was very pivotal for me because that was a bit a, a very healing space. And it was very unassuming, very like there's charisma there, certainly, but it's it's not about the show. It's about showing up. Well, that's so beautiful. You know, I'm, I'm thinking about the teacher, the word that you, you use um, really struck out to me. And that's this teacher showed his humanity. You know, so um, there's this aspect of all of us that are or all of us. We can all be charismatic. We can all be sort of like the, the, the woman or the man or something like that. At the same time, we're human. You know, um, there are things about us which are, you know, a little bit messy or whatever. And for me, when I can see that in somebody who's like in a position of um, being a role model or something like that, I feel a little bit more comfortable. You know, I feel like this person is not just like showing, is like not playing any kind of game on me. This is a real human being. You know, that's some, something which I, anyway, that's something that I particularly got out of what you were saying. Yeah. You know, um, Laura, um, you have a lot of different things going on right now. And I guess one of the things I wanted to talk about briefly, um, uh, you, you've got this, this, this project that you're, you're doing now. Um, this is coming out. It's almost too late to get involved, but it's called self, the summer of self care. And um, I know you're going to be doing it again. Uh, can you say about a little bit about, about the importance of self care and maybe you can talk about a little bit of how you manage your, your own self care uh, in this very confusing time that we're living in. Sure. So, uh, as it turns out, self-care was a huge part of my healing journey. Mm. And, you know, and I already made reference to some of the practitioners I had in my life. So that was going on before the, the trauma. But um, I've always had a penchant for taking care of my, my, phys my physical body. And, and I think that's what people people think of most of the time first when it comes to self-care. Right. Because our body, I mean, let's face it, we're, we're riding around in it. Um, it's finite. And, you know, a lot of us put more energy into maintaining our cars than, than, <laughs> than our bodies. Our souls, right. <laughs> right. So that, then, you know, so, um, but looking back on, you know, it when it comes up and I don't, it's too exhausting for me to try to show up as, um, I mean, I was going to say to show up as this warrior, you know, with all the armor on, but um, I guess I'm a warrior of a different kind. I'm, I've got the wounds of my experience and I tried to hide it for so long. It's just exhausting. Mm. And, you know, and so I find, and I don't lead with it, but it's just there. And so I think it also allows me to have compassion and empathy when I'm speaking to people and, and coaching people. So that's kind of like the full package. But to maintain that, um, it has required a certain amount of self-care. So what self-care looks like to me is um, paying attention to my body. Um, I feel like for a very long time, I was disconnected from it. And it, and it wasn't that I wasn't um, taking care of it, but it was almost like I was living six inches over to the left and six <laughs> up. I just wasn't dialed in. And I do think um, that that was a function of the, sh you know, the, the shock to the system. And uh, so now when I'm talking to other people about self-care, it doesn't need to be expensive. What it does need to be is intentional. And throughout this first, you know, the, the beta version of the summer of self-care, you know, like last year I did it myself. This year I took a small group of people along for the ride, which meant I needed to organize it, which looks less like self-care. But, yeah. um, <laughs> but having people along um, was fantastic self-care because community is a part of self-care. Mm -hmm. You know, having community and connection, consciously cultivating that. 
but also incorporating principles that I would incorporate into say leadership coaching or business coaching, which is, you know, a, alignment to what feels good, help, having healthy boundaries, practicing discernment. You know, these principles, if you think about alignment, discernment, and boundaries, well, they're all three characteristics of, you know, strong leadership and healthy followership, but they're also big in self-care. So I've started to look at life recently through the lens of self-care mm. and realize that sometimes the kindest and most compassionate thing that you can do for yourself is also the hardest. Mm -hmm. It could be your bookkeeping. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it could be seeing a therapist. Yeah. I'm guilty on the bookkeeping one. Yeah. It could be phoning somebody who, you know, you, you have a problem with or a challenge to the relationship and taking the, the, the first step towards reconciliation or healing. So this has turned into, you know, it's, it's like an, ex everything that I've, that I've experienced and I've found that has worked for me over the years in particular, the, the last say five years is what I've, you know, integrated in, into everything that I do. And, uh, and that seems to work be very well because not only does it let me do something constructive with, you know, the, the fruits of what happened, but also it keeps me in that space, which is healthy and, and correct for me. Um, you're Canadian. So I, I imagine it's a little bit calmer in Canada than it is in the United States. Um, America is just, United States is just, it's just nuts these days. Um, I, I guess that's kind of a, a bridge to ask you, what do you personally do on a day-to-day -day basis to keep yourself sort of grounded and uh, open to spirit, I'll call it? Well, I will preface that, Angela. I'm not sure we're calmer. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure that we're calmer. It's an election year here in Canada. Uh, we have a very conservative um, government provincially. Uh, there's signs of instability and you know we are living on an interconnected planet and what's going on you know in your country with the amazon and with Brazil, china Europe, with, it's like everywhere it it affects us all and so this is why i've started talking about um 10 years ago more because or 11 years ago now more because it's reminding me of the stresses of the recession mm -hmm. I'm not saying there's some debate whether or not we're about to go into another one. I'm not here to, you know, fear monger or, or, you know, debate that. But what I am seeing is, is the similarities in terms of the wear and tear on people's psyche mm. and, and spirit. So what I do is I meditate. I attempt to meditate every day and <laughs> with the change of season coming up, um, I find that I focus on one thing to, to, you know, a certain level. So for the last nine months, my thing has been yoga. Mm -hmm. I needed to attend to my body. I was having some issues with vertigo. Um, it all checked out all clear, but it was, a. I, I take something like that as a signal, whatever the cause was that it's time to stop in moments of stress saying, I need to get back to please mm -hmm. yoga. Mm -hmm it's actually time to go back to yoga. And so I do practice yoga. I do meditate. Um, at times I have embraced long distance running. I find that very cathartic. There's something, and, and I'm not a good runner. Oh my gosh. Um, but, uh, but there's something cathartic about the, the rhythm of it. That is on a very rare occasion, somewhat meditative, mostly onerous, but, what that does with my stress levels and my ability to focus and my energy is it, it helps me to, to do a better job thriving. Mm. Those, those are my big, those are my big ones. Um, I'm also insurance companies will hate me, but I'm also a big, big believer. in if you've got benefits, use it or lose it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> so, a lot of people don't explore which I do, you know, as a self-employed person, mm. I made sure very early on that I invested in benefits and, and I do make sure that I continue the practice of seeing, you know, a fairly regular massage, seeing a chiropractor, all 
hopefully for the long-term preventive rather than reactive. Well, this is, this is great, Laura. And um, 